This is going to be a weird one. I'm not going to lie. It's going to be very weird. Uh, this is the Battle of Blenheim 1704 from Legion War Games and designer by Steve, uh, designed by Steve Pohl. This is 7 Hex 6 System Volume 1. You may have seen this game before. Um, I remember kind of just seeing it like on Board Game Geek and in some war game circles. It came out in 2018, so it's pretty old, you know, six years old right now. Um, but it is on the Battle of Blenheim from the uh, Battle of, or War of Spanish Succession, which is a topic that we've been covering quite a bit here. And this continues kind of my exploration of various tactical systems from the Age of Enlightenment. Now, this one... <laughs> so, the reason I own this is because uh, Legion War Games is having a 4th of July sale, and this game was 50% uh, off. And I'm currently in sort of a very, like, Age of Reason kind of vibe right now. And so I was like, 50% off? I, you can't beat that price. I love Legion stuff. They always do really creative games. So I decided to pick it up at that price. Um, and I'm really happy I did, because I really didn't know anything about it other than that it was part of the 7 hex system, and I knew that the map looked weird. Um, but I didn't know, like... What it, how you played it or anything like that. So here is the map, the Battle of Blenheim, and uh, you've got the French, uh, the Franco-Bavarians down here. They're separated into kind of three wings. You can see some of the units. Uh, we've got uh, Marshal Tallard here, um, Tallard. We've got uh, de Marsin. Of course, we've got the Bavarians on the left. That's uh, Maximilian II, who we just saw in the Battle of uh, Hochstedt, if you watch that video. And in fact, uh, if you're thinking, wow, that map looks really familiar, that is because the Battle of Blenheim and the Battle of Hochstedt were fought on the exact same ground. Uh, you remember the uh, Usson's column coming up this way, the Austrians here, the French army coming in from this direction, the Austrians trying to get out of the battlefield up this road. They didn't do it. The French won. One year later, here we are back around this area, <laughs> um, and uh, we've got another clash, this time between the Duke of Marlborough and uh, his Anglo-allied army and the Franco-Bavarians here. Um, so this is one of the most famous battles of Marlborough's career, one of the most famous battles of the War of Spanish Succession. Um, and this is a game on that topic, and it looks interesting. Well, it looked interesting. And, and now that I've read the rules, it actually seems very interesting uh, what is going on here. So you can see the map, which I actually really like the map. You can see the the color palette on this map is really gorgeous. I really like some of the details, like how the, the green around the rivers is a little bit um, exaggerated. You really get a sense of the terrain. It feels very, like the color saturation is feels very nice. But you can see that the game map is made up of these weird shaped spaces uh, in addition to hexes. So we've got a hex map with sort of like larger mega hex kind of things going on. What does all of that mean? Well, that is the whole basis for this game and what it's all about. Basically, using this really strange system of movement um, and formation control, essentially, uh, these mega hexes uh, are sort of reflect kind of the organization and deployment of the forces. So let's talk about scale real quick so we can kind of understand what we're talking about here. So each of these mega hex areas here, I'm going to call them mega hexes even though they're not hexes, but these areas are about 500 yards across. So we're talking, um, you know, like 40% uh, larger than uh, all of the games we've played up to this point from this era. We were looking at like 275 to 330 um, yards per hex in the previous games that we've played. This is, this is 500 yards here. So each hex here is you know about 175 yards. So we're talking a much smaller area. However, the units size here are um, the, the infantry um, specifically. Let's see if I can find one. That's French cavalry. There's some infantry. I like the art. Looks pretty nice. Uh, the infantry um, are three battalions per counter. So if you, the equivalent of that would be a three strength counter from Piacenza, if you watch that video. Um, th that was also three battalions. So we're looking at kind of the same um, size unit, uh, but sort of bigger areas. Um, so we got that out of the way. You can kind of see that the scale is similar, uh, if not exactly the same, as um, the Battles of Louis XIV game we played, as Piacenza, and as uh, Campo Santo 1743. Now, that's where all of this uh, similarities end because we're talking about a game here that is using some very novel mechanics and I just very interesting approaches to how it's simulating the tactical maneuver and effect of, of movement and combat um, in this era. Um, I don't want to give that to you up front all at once because it's kind of, it's so novel that it's a lot to take in. Um, but the one thing I do want to comment on is that this was uh, billed as a series, like on the box it says... 
seven hex system volume one there are supposedly going to be more volumes coming but i don't know if that's actually true board game geek has a has a battles a couple battles from the great northern war and a napoleonic era seven hex system game that are apparently under development and design and will be published i think by legion but this apparently did not sell very well um so i don't know if we'll ever see them so right now even though it is volume one this is the only game in the system uh at the current moment um which works for our purposes here um, okay. What do I want to talk about next? Let me, let's talk about victory because it's, it's a fairly simple game. Actually, the rules are only 11 pages. Um, they're really well done. Um, pretty easy to get a handle on their nice paper, nicer than what Legion normally does, I would say. Um, and the game also comes with, uh, two sets of two player aids here. We can see those. Um, which is interesting, kind of the Legion style of, like, not doing reverse. Like, this could have been just one sheet. Uh, but hey, I guess this works. So, th the game is kind of played off these charts. Once you kind of understand the basic mechanics, you can play the whole game from here. As you see, a lot of them are modifiers. Most of this game is about modifiers. And so, um, we'll see how that works in practice. But, um, essentially, what we're trying to do here is win the Battle of Blenheim. And the way that you win the Battle of Blenheim is by controlling two of the three towns. We've got Blenheim here, we've got, uh, Oberglauheim here, and we've got, uh, Lutzingen, Lutzingen up here. So, if you control two of those three, and you eliminate 12 enemy units, you win the game. Uh, time scale in this game, each turn is 20 minutes, so we could potentially go 15 turns. Uh, so it's three turns an hour, so we're talking about, was that five hours? Yeah. Uh, so um, in that amount of time, we're trying to seize two of the three towns, and we're trying to eliminate... Um, 12 units of the opposition. Now, going about doing that is going to be an interesting adventure. Um, but in general, the French, the Franco-Bavarians are going to be sort of in a defensive posture, and the uh, Anglo allies are going to be in a more attacking posture. They obviously don't control the town, so they're going to want to try and, and take them. Historically, Marlborough sent his, made the attack on the flanks to force the French to divert units um, before he could move into the center and crush them. Obviously, Blenheim was a victory. Uh, for the Anglo allies, uh, and so we're going to try and replicate that here. Um, this game appear apparently plays very well solo because of its order system, and we'll get into that in a moment. And I guess the only other thing I want to talk about uh, with regards to this game is um, the fact that unit type is uh, modeled as well. So as we saw in Battles of Louis the Fifteenth, um, you know we have Pistolier cavalry, we have. Um, uh, we have uh, infantry that fires by platoon, and we also have infantry that fires in, by line, by, I don't know, I forget the exact term is, by cohort or whatever, um, by battalion, maybe. Um, so we're going to see that in action, and I'll show you, it's not reflected on the counters, but it is reflected in the gameplay mechanics, and I'll show you how that works um, in general. Here's a look at the battlefield. Here on the right uh, wing, uh, we've got Talar's French, um, who I guess historically were all infected with some kind of weird sickness, so none of their units can stack with any other units in the French uh, in the French wings, which is kind of an interesting historical thing. Uh, we've got uh, Marshal de Massin here in the center, um, sort of lightly defended here. We've got some artillery pieces, um, and then we've got uh, Maximilian II here on the left, and then he is meeting. He's going up against uh, Prince Eugen uh, of the. Um, Austrians, uh, and along with Prince Eugen, we've got the Duke of Marlborough, Marlborough down here. So, um, should be a nice clash. I expect most of the action to be taking place in here. Let's just get into it, because this is a weird one. All right, so Marlborough moves first with the uh, Allies, and uh, this is where we get into some of the weirdness of the game. So, the very first phase of the game is strategic movement, and there are three types of strategic moves. There's movement by road, uh, with some rules and how far you can go. There's um, movement without road, and then there's redeployment. Redeployment is redeploying your units from the center of an area to the hexes or vice versa. Um, I'm not going to get into the specifics, but uh, in general, if you're moving by road, you cannot move into an area that is adjacent to an area with an enemy. So, for example, I could not move, uh, I could not road move here because that's adjacent to this area here, uh, and I, nor could I go here and then here. But you can move from one area. Uh, to an adjacent area with the second type of strategic movement as long as you're not blocked by blocking terrain. That's what these M marshes are for. There might be a couple other types of blocking terrain, but in general, as long as there's uh, adjacent hexes in the areas open to one another, you can move. So for example, I could take with Marlboro, I could take these infantry units and I could move them to this one. When you move, you always move center of area to center of area. And because that path here doesn't contain marsh, I would be allowed to do that. And so this is where some of the genius, I think, comes in, uh, which is units in the center of an area are sort of arrayed for movement, essentially, for maneuver, um, whether that's in column or they're lined up and ready to 
um, maneuver on the battlefield versus units that are in the hexes uh, inside, like on the hex edge or the area edge, they are not allowed to maneuver. They must, if they were going to maneuver, they first have to move back to the center of this and then they can move center to center. So it's kind of abstracting away the sort of like line column or dress ranks, uh, get in, you know, get ready to go somewhere, um, by simply making it a geographic, um, aspect of what you're doing on your turn. So I think what I'm going to do first is we've got some cavalry here. Um, I definitely want to get rid of this artillery if I can. You know, it, it seems to make sense that we would go here. Um, if we could possibly do that. We definitely want, we're on the attack. We want to move and we want to attack. So and we don't necessarily want to attack across rivers, although we won't be able to probably help it. So let's, uh, I believe I'm allowed to move these guys. And they're allowed to move center to center. And then because they have now entered an area... Um, uh, yeah, so now now once we're in contact, essentially is what we are here, uh, we have to stop. And uh, we're not allowed to leave that area until we're no longer in contact. So you're really committing your forces when you move them um, to to contact. And uh, then you're going to be stuck there. And that's something that I think uh, is, is seen in a lot of these um, war uh, battles from the Age of Enlightenment. So I'm going to look through all of this and see what I'm going to do. I'm still kind of learning, but I do know that Marlboro needs to attack. Uh, and then we'll come back. So I have no idea if this is a tactically good decision or not, but I'm going to follow the historical plan. I'm going to put the pressure on the flanks. So we've got Marlborough's wing coming in here. We've got Eugen's wing coming down here. We're going to try and crunch off the uh, very edges of the French formation. Uh, I should tell you a little bit about the counter. So we've got combat power down in the lower right. Um, and then in the upper right, we've got stacking points. Every area in this game can only have six total stacking points in it. Um, and you can never exceed that ever. So uh, your positioning and how you move is really important. Also, some of these units, you can see the difference between these two. There's a, there's a little artillery symbol on that. That means that that infantry has battalion guns. That gives it a bonus in combat. So we definitely want to be attacking with our units that have battalion guns. And uh, yeah, um, Blenheim's going to be a tough one to crack because the city gives defensive bonuses. Combat's really weird. We'll get there in a minute. But that is strategic, excuse me, strategic movement. Not a lot happening in here. You can see a lot of these... Uh, like hex site you can't actually enter marsh hexes or woods hexes up here they have the letters in them so you're not allowed to go in there so um there's probably not going to be a lot of combat that happens uh in this area so we're just going to hang back with the center and see how the battle unfolds so next we go to ranged fire this is where artillery units can fire and you can see that all of the artillery in this scenario starts on a on an area edge that means um that the artillery is pointed towards the two bordering areas in an arc and beyond. So this artillery unit can fire basically this way. So it's, its cone is like that, basically. So it's pointing this direction. Ar when artillery fires, you look at the uh, artillery fire table, you're rolling, I believe, 2d6. Um, and uh, based on how far away uh, you're shooting, uh, you need a certain target number in order to do a hit. So we're about to do that here with the uh, allies. And... Um, and we'll see what happens. Interestingly, in artillery, uh, as the firer, you get to choose uh, the unit that takes the casualty. So that's kind of cool. So it's actually the non-active player's artillery that fires. So very similar to Battles of the American Revolution. Uh, the non-active player's artillery fires, um, which makes sense as the attackers are advancing, the artillery is firing. Um, all, we put markers on the fired artillery. The, uh, the um, French have six. Um, what I'm learning, artillery, not very effective, which is very period accurate. The artillery was junk in this, in this era. Uh, it certainly was not like it was in the Napoleonic era, and uh, we missed every shot. Um, so you're looking for a target number when you're firing, depending on how far away you're firing. The, the size and weight of the artillery determines what your maximum range is, and then you roll 2d6 to see if you can get that fire. You choose a stack. If you do a hit, you do a hit. Um, in this case, we didn't do any hits. Uh, it's, it's eight or above. Even at point blank, you still got to roll an eight. So the odds are um, more likely than not that you will miss or at least not have any sort of fire effect on the enemy. So uh, we have done that. Now we're going to the orders phase, and this is where the game gets kind of interesting. So we're going to... Every time you give an order, basically, is you, you can make an attack with a unit or... Um, uh, uh, essentially, that's what orders are for. They're for attacking. Um, you might be able to do some other things, too. Uh, yeah, you can do tactical movement as well, um, which is another form of movement. But basically, uh, you choose uh, the area, I believe, that you want to give the orders to, and then you roll your two dice. Why are you rolling your two dice? Well, I'll explain. So here's what happens. You roll your dice. You look at the value of the white die. You add together, or to the white die, 
you add your faction's order modifier. So in this game, it's always at the beginning of a turn, the Anglo uh, allies get plus three and the uh, French get plus two. So we come back over here to the dice, plus three to the white die, that makes it a four. Um, that is higher than what I rolled on the red die, which is a two. That means I can successfully do my order. Uh, and choose a unit and do something with them. If I had not gotten higher than the red die, my turn is over. It is done. I can't do anything else, and we go on to the French turn, basically. So there's this really unpredictable activation system at work here um, where you're going to roll the dice every time you want to do something. And the more, and so I should mention is like after I do my order, then I, then I would roll again to give another order. But this time, every subsequent order is minus one off the modifier and value of the white die. Um, so you can't, you will reach a point eventually where you're going to stop giving orders just by simple math. Um, so it's a kind of unpredictable end to the turn. So you're never going to be able to do everything optimally. Um, and different factions of the battlefield, you're going to want to focus on first because you can always, you know, you're more likely than not to get uh, your first order done. I'm actually going to play with an optional rule in the rule book that says your first order is always successful. Um, so, uh, I just rolled to show you, but my first order is always going to be successful. After you give an order, you're going to decrease for that minus one, you're going to decrease the order modifier. So the next time I roll, I'm only going to get plus two on the white die and you can order a unit multiple times in a row. And that way it kind of reminds me of like rebel fury where a unit can do multiple things in a turn. Um, until like you, you can't attack more than twice, but other than that, you can kind of do multiple things in a turn and you're just going to keep rolling until it's over and then your turn's done and you go to the French. So it's extremely quick playing and can be very quick playing if you get some really bad dice back to back with your opponent. Um, so that's the order system and I'm going to go now and figure out what the heck I'm going to do. So here's where we get to the fun bits and that's the combat. And I, there's a lot of stuff here that I think is kind of really interesting. So first of all, uh, my first order, these guys here are going to attack these guys here. And the way we do that is we're doing it by area. So one area always attacks an adjacent area because um, essentially a, an attack is a move from one area to the other. Um, by the way the rules are written, that does mean that only units in the center hex of an area can attack because if you are in a hex, uh, a border hex, you have to move back to the center first. And because you're only allowed one move as a tactical movement, you cannot attack if you are on the edge of an area. So that means that uh, being on the edge means you're in a defensive posture, and being in the middle means you're in a an offensive posture. And that's all, there's no rules for that. I mean, there are rules, but like, it's all subtly um, reinforced by the rules. And so that's what, essentially that means. It doesn't ever say anywhere in the rule book, you are the defender if you are in the hexes adjacent to the center of an area. It just, that's the way that the rules lead you down, the, the road that they lead you down. So... Uh, okay, so how do we calculate attacks? Um, so this is where there's a lot of computation <laughs> involved. So um, the first thing we do is we look at the unit types who are defending. So every unit in an area being attacked defends. You add up their total value of their combat power. So five, 10 there, pretty easy. Then we look at this table of modifiers. So um, you know, do you have combined arms defending? Well, there we do not. Do we have a platoon firer? So in this game, the only units that are platoon firers are the attackers under uh, Marlboro. The uh, Eugens, uh, Austrians are not platoon fires and no other unit is a platoon fire. So it's kind of representing the leader's um, tactics and drilling, which is another neat aspect to the game that doesn't need much special rules. So um, the defenders, nope, they don't have any platoon fires. Do they have any battalion guns? Yes, one of the units has battalion guns. You can kind of just make that out there. So with, to our 10, we are going to add plus one per unit with battalion guns. So we're up to 11. We don't, um, and then this is where you get into the flanking modifier. So for each undisrupted unit located on one of the two outer hexes through which the attack is launched, you get some bonus defense. Um, and there's two. Uh, so because the attack is coming from this area, both of these hexes is where the attack is coming from. So we've got two there. So that's two per unit. So that's another four. So we're up to 15. And then for each undisrupted unit other than artillery located on an outer hex other than one. So this is where you'd get flanked, right? So if you had a unit down here or here and they attack something from this direction, it would be a penalty. So you don't want to get surrounded, right? You want your defenders to be facing the line of attack, um, which is makes total sense. And then for each undisrupted artillery unit located in an outer unit that's not the direction of being attacked, you'd get a minus one. So we're up to 15 defensive value for the defenders. Then we're going to look at the attackers and we're going to do a very similar thing. We've got 10 points there. Plus, we're going to add uh, the modifiers here. There's a lot more for the attackers here. Um, you know, we haven't uh, had attacked with these units previously, because remember, you can order units more than once. Um, you would have them if that's the case. Any of the defending units have already been attacked. So if they've already been attacked, like if my first order was to attack from here to here and then attack, we would get some bonuses for exhausting the defenders. We don't have any mixed... I don't think we have... Uh, 
No, they're both infantry, so we don't have any combined arms. Uh, we do have platoon firers attacking per unit. So each unit is a platoon firer under Marlboro. So that's a plus four. Um, so we're at four. And then do we have battalion guns? Yes, we have one unit of battalion guns, so we're at 15. And then this is where, again, you look at flanking. Defending units are adjacent to more areas containing enemy units than areas containing friendly units, and that difference is one. So if we uh, were able to get on a flank of these units, so you can see this this unit, this area, is adjacent to one friendly and one enemy, so therefore the difference is zero, right? So there's no modifier for that. But if we were able to stack up attackers next to the defender, you'd get some bonuses there. Um, and uh, and you know then there's an extra level of that. If you're attacking into lower ground, we're not. Containing a town, we get some bad modifiers there into... Um, the cavalry attacking into town is bad. Infantry attacking into town is bad. Attacking higher ground or across a fordable river. Uh, we are doing that here, actually, because you can see the river there. So, um, uh, so minus three. So we're at 12. And then cavalry charge. So what's interesting about cavalry charge in this game is that you can declare that your cavalry is charging, and it's kind of a double-edged sword. You potentially are stronger when you cavalry charge, but you can also get countercharged, which reduces the charge bonus. And then depending on how the battle goes, your charging cavalry will automatically take hits, as, um, even if you win the battle. So uh, you want to be careful when you do that. We'll see some cavalry charges later. So anyways, I believe what we uh, ended up getting to was um, 13... Uh, to 15. So that's the difference in the two, the attacker versus the defender. And I really wish they had, uh, like, like tokens for the, the total battle strength. It's hard to remember, this, especially if you're playing solo, but uh, I guess you'd have each player calculate it. So, but then we look here. You modify each of those values, divide them, in, divide them in half, and round down. So the 13 becomes a 6, the 15 becomes a 7, so it's 6 to 7 in favor of the defender. Then, depending on the leaders you have in the combat, which in this case we don't have any leaders, we're going to roll a number of d6 per side. So in this case, we're both going to roll a d6. That d6 roll is going to be added... Um, to your uh, adjusted combat values. Remember, it's six to seven. If we had had um, an experienced commander, um, then we'd add 2d6, and you take the highest one. And if you had an exceptional commander, in, like Marlboro, for example, or Oigan, then you would roll 3d6 and take the highest one. So your leadership matters, and it gives you a better chance to add a bonus. So let's roll our two. And uh, obviously, the, the red is the allies. So um, six plus five is 11. 7 plus 2 is 9. That's a difference of 2. So the side with the final uh, higher score wins the combat. Um, so uh, then you look at losses. So uh, what did we say we had? We had 11 and 9, so the difference is 2. So half the number of hits which the winning side inflicts, half of 2 is 1, is the number of hits which the losing side takes. And then we roll again. <laughs> It's kind of a, it's an interesting combat system. It's kind of convoluted, uh, but I imagine doing this a bunch, I'll, I'll get it. So then we roll again, and there's a potential bonus to the number of casualties we do. So it was one hit, adjusted by 1d6. Um, so we roll for the winner. That was, and we rolled a six, so that gives us actually a bonus hit. Because if you look here, if we'd rolled one or two, we would have reduced hits by one, three, four, five, no adjustment. And six gives an, uh, an adjustment of plus one. Um, so we've done two hits, and the number of hits you can do can never actually be more... Um, than the number of uh, units that the losing side had. So um, we did uh, two hits here. So we're probably going to take it like this and like this rather than eliminate a unit. So both of these become disrupted. That was a pretty good attack. It was a good roll. You can see here there's like some deterministic elements and then there's also some uh, like dice elements uh, that working together. And it's very unique. I've never seen anything quite like it. Um, and I imagine that playing the game well involves knowing the modifiers by heart and kind of what the advantageous attack situations are. So there's some depth here to get good at the game. Um, and I believe that's the end of the combat. Then we have to deal with retreats. Um, yeah, if the attacker wins and had a final AV of four or more, the defenders must retreat. We didn't. It was, it was 11 to 9. Um, so it was a def of two. So the defenders have the option to stay or retreat and withdraw. Um, and I think here, because they're both disrupted, they probably want to withdraw, especially considering there's another another river here. So let's go ahead and do that, and then I'll come back. All right, so we made our withdrawal to the center hex 
of an area adjacent from away from the, the direction that the attack was made. Um, unfortunately, because of the withdrawal, we don't get to advance. We only get to advance if we force a retreat. So those attacking units are going to have to stay there. We're not going to be able to, as far as I read the rules, we're not going to be able to move in here to try and exploit the next attack against the town of Blenheim. Uh, but before we get to the next attack, I need to roll my orders. So that was my first order complete was that combat. Now we roll again to see what we get. Remember, I'm adding plus two to the white die. So yeah, so eight to three. I get to make another order now. And I'm just going to keep doing that until my turn is over. Um, and then we'll go to sort of the um, attrition and rally step, and I'll show you how that works. All right, well, we managed to get three orders this turn before uh, our turn was over. Um, not as many as I would have hoped, but it was pretty good. So we did make an attack from here to here. Um, unfortunately, the French defenders held strong, and we ended up having to disrupt a unit. We disrupted that infantry, uh, and the defenders held. So now we go, uh, and then the other move I did is I moved the units that had attacked over here down to the Danube here, um, and they're in a really good position now to try and take Blenheim um, with the support of these other units. So I rode that flank fl and uh, wrap them up, or um, roll them up, I guess. So now we go to the attrition phase, and this is, or sorry, the rally phase, and this is where we see if uh, units that became disrupted uh, actually route. Um, so it's very dangerous to take casualties in this game because there's a chance you can route. So the only one that we have is this guy here, this infantry, you can see he's d disrupted. And uh, what we do here is um, we look at the, so if he was with um, a leader, like if Marlborough was in that area, he would rally automatically. Um, but because we don't have a leader, we have to make a die roll to see if he routes. And the way we do that is we add together um, the number of uh, friendly units in the same area who have already routed or in an adjacent area in his, in his area or adjacent areas have already routed, um, plus the number of immediately adjacent areas containing enemy units where all of their enemy units are in good order. So one, two, three areas where all the enemy units are in good order. No one else is routed. So that three is our negative value. Then we have the positive value, which is the number of units in good order in the area where he is, and that cavalry unit under him is in good, uh, good order, plus the immediately adjacent areas. So we've got one, two more uh, here. So uh, one, two, three, so it's three to three. Um, that value, and then we make a die roll, and this is where it could get interesting. <laughs> um, and this die roll is a one, so that one, if it's a one, it subtracts two from that difference. So now we are uh, at negative two. because it is three to one, three negative conditions, one positive condition. Um, and uh, if that result is negative, which it is negative two, um, we, the unit routes, uh, which means he's just straight out eliminated. So this attack, very bad. We've eliminated our first unit from play um, with, from an attack that should have gone well, but didn't. And the French are up one, uh, or have the first uh, casualty that they need of the 12 that they're looking for. Now, after this phase, we would go to attrition. Um, so this is where we would see uh, if, if fire, essentially is simulating what happens with fire combat. Um, and this is where we would, so, you know, fire combat is presumed to be happening across the line. So we look anywhere that there is a uh, friendly unit on an edge hex in an area adjacent to an enemy combat unit. Um, and then we roll some dice and see uh, if we disrupt those units. So I'll take a look at that and show you. So yeah, as we go down the line, it turns out there actually is no area where attrition might come into play. If we had any of the the um, English or the uh, Austrians sort of butted up against an edge hex here, it's assumed that fire combat is taking place. Again, one of those cool abstractions that of course that's happening. You know, as you, when you think about it, you're like, yeah, if I'm next to the unit, we're going to be ordering fire. But unlike other games I've played in other systems from this era, you're not, you don't have to, there's no process. You don't have to do a fire combat with a bunch of die rolls. It's just presumed to have happened and then you check the effects at the end of the turn to see if that fire combat disrupted a unit. I think that's actually very elegant, um, and it reminds me a lot of Last 100 Yards. So you've got kind of this like quantum information state, like this thing is happening and you don't know if there's going to be an effect until sort of the end of the turn, uh, which is kind of neat. But in this case, we don't have that situation. I imagine as we get closer um, to the, uh, towards the end of the game, we might see some more of that. Um, with the attrition phase over, I believe we're going to pass now to the French. I don't know that their turn is going to be very long. Oh, command unit. We can move our leaders. So our leaders are allowed to move. I'm thinking I might want to move the Duke of Mar Marlborough up here to take Blenheim. Um, I'm going to need his three dice in combat probably. 
Okay, so just want to correct one thing that I've done wrong so far, which I'm pretty proud of as far as I've caught, is that strategic movement at the beginning of a turn can only be done with units in or adjacent to your commander. So Marlboro started here, and uh, the only strategic movements I could have made were any of the units around him, uh, command radius. Obviously, that makes total sense. Um, I, I moved anything back that I think I might have cheated with. Um, so he started here. He's got to go back there. He moved down, I think, here somewhere. He's got to go back there. I think the only thing I cheated with was his cavalry. I don't want to try and unwind it. Um, the attack was a failure anyway. This cavalry probably could not... Either I would have had to roll an extra order that I didn't roll, or this cavalry moved in strategic movement. So I'm not super concerned about it. Um, it, it everything else was legal. Um, so I fixed it, and no, I know going forward that command radius is a thing. Marlboro's down here now, setting up for an assault on Blenheim, if we can get there. Uh, but it's the French turn. So we've come to the end of turn two, about to start turn three. I think I have a handle on most of the mechanics of the game now. Um, I did make a few mistakes that I've gone off camera and corrected. Um, I think earlier I, I mistakenly told you that the die roll after combat for the bonus casualty uh, applied to the uh, winner. It's not, it applied to the loser, which meant there was some additional casualties in some of these battles that I gave to the wrong side. So I went back and fixed that. This should be correct. Um... And uh, there were a couple of artillery shots, I think, that I did out of arc um, that uh, I went back and, and fixed and corrected. So um, it should be all good now. I've got a couple turns under my belt, and we're going to move forward. Um, on this, the French artillery actually is pretty effective over on this flank. You can see that Prince Eugen sent some units up into these highlands. You get a bonus for attacking downhill. I'm trying to surround this hex to get um, uh, get sort of in a position to assault Lutzingen. Lutzingen. Um, but uh, French artillery stymied that assault. Um, the British have, or the Angle allies, have not been rolling well on the orders. They've only been getting one or two orders a turn, un unluckily. The French have been getting more, but they're in the positions they feel like they want to be in. They moved some cavalry up to the river line, and uh, they managed to get and extract some of their demoralized units. One of the things in this system that uh, is really, really apparent to me is that as soon as you become demoralized, you need to pull those guys out of the line quickly because there's a chance every turn that they rout if they're next to an undisrupted enemy unit. And it's not, it's not a, it's a pretty high chance um, that they route. So um, you want to, if you can afford the orders, get your demoralized and disrupted units um, off the line so that they don't take that casualty. Hopefully you can rally them later with your leader. Um, and so leader positioning is super important. You can see Marlboro, he, he was used on this attack here. Uh, where was it? There was an attack in here with Marlboro that he won, but now he needs to pull back because not only does he need to be able to rally units, but he also needs to be able to command units. And I don't think the Angle allies are going to be able to achieve the breakthrough they need with only these units here. So we need to move more units in to threatening positions um, to try and surround Blenheim. Uh, so there's some really interesting implications here of how maneuver um, and command structure supports attacks. You're not really getting a, a front attack along the entire battlefield. You're really targeted one or two attacks per turn so far um, on very specific areas um, to try and achieve your goal. So uh, it's pretty interesting how um, the leadership facilitates that, and it's pretty interesting how um, sort of the hot zones of the battle um, are, are very, like, surgically targeted. Um, so artillery, defensive artillery, really important if you can get it to land. And marching adjacent to artillery, not a good idea. Terrain also in this battle is uh, proving to be quite challenging, so it's a really interesting puzzle um, that's really unlike anything I've ever played um, in terms of just some of the mechanics um, on display here. Uh, we've gotten one casualty apiece, some French infantry, some Anglo cavalry, um, so no one's done any more losses yet. Everyone's trying to be very careful with their um, disrupted units to make sure they don't die. Uh, so yeah, we're going to go into turn three, and I will start a new video for that since we've gone on long enough for this one, and we'll play out the rest of the game.